Walking a path along the roots of Pikes Peak, you take a fork in the road toward the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside is a raucous conversation on the arts, faith, and whether we like the Senate now that they've made daylight savings time permanent. At a quarter table by the fire, there are three people. One is arguing that, no, the Senate needs to do a whole lot better than that. That's me, Mandy Hauck, your host for the day. Welcome to Believe to See, a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. The Anselm Society is a coalition of churches across the front range of Colorado dedicated to one simple goal, a renaissance of the Christian imagination. To find out more about the Anselm Society, please visit us at anselmsociety.org. And while you're there, please rate and review the show on whatever app you're using to listen right now. In the meantime, well, Matt, what's your opinion on the Daylight Savings Time? Yeah, well, first off, talk of, we're getting political here, talking about the <laughs> Senate and whatnot. But I guess, you know, regardless of your politics, you can walk up to any person on the street and see, like, Senate's a real piece of work, right? And they'll right. agree with you. So. <laughs> well, my angle was more, hey, they finally did something non-controversial mm. that pretty much everyone now, can agree with. I love Daylight Savings because yes. I love warmth and sunshine. Yes. But my wife... Uh oh. She prefers it getting dark earlier because I guess she likes darkness and cold. I don't know. Maybe I'm not articulating her argument fairly. <laughs> but are, you're pro daylight savings, right? I am right? pro. Okay. I'm pro not changing the clocks back and forth. I don't really care which one oh, they choose. Oh, really? I just just stop. Stop changing the clocks. Now, please. I would rather change the clocks than have this fall back thing. I do not like early sunsets. Here I thought I had this completely non-controversial opinion, and I guess there's no such thing. Well, I think most people will like it, but okay. I'm just anticipating some grumpy people like, when I wake up at five o'clock for no reason, <laughs> I'll, it's dark for too long. Oh, well. At least I think, I assume that's what they say. I don't know. Oh, well, I guess that you can argue about anything, but, but today <laughs> we're not going to argue. The story is, we're not, people yeah. are grumpy about everything. There, there you go. But somebody who I find delightful all the time. Good is, segue. Yeah. Nancy Soderstrom. It's very nice to have you here, Nancy. How are you doing? Good. It's nice to be here. Good. So Nancy is an Anselm Guild artist. And can you tell us a little bit about what kind of art you do? Well, um, when I joined Anselm, I was a potter, and mm -hmm. I have that's been pretty much my art medium of choice, probably since the last 15 years. Time, okay. Time goes fast. Time goes so fast. That only takes you to the mid-aughts. It does. What? That's crazy. <laughs> so... Anyway, keep going. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I started pottery about 15 years ago and had always wanted to be a potter, have always loved pottery and tile. And so I primarily did that until uh, I got COVID in April. What year is it? 2022? It is. <laughs> um, yeah, the last two years have gone quite slowly. <laughs> so, yeah, so because I have asthma, I had sequestered myself pretty well. Right. But out of necessity for a family funeral, needed to travel in April 2021. And contracted COVID somewhere along the way. It was pretty severe and my recovery mm -hmm. didn't really allow me to interact with people for a while because my immune system was kind of shot. Which for you is torture because you are <laughs> one of the few extroverted artists that I know. <laughs> I think that term has been applied to me, although yes. living in isolation has changed my bent a little bit. But oh, really? Yeah. So in order to do surface design and pottery, which I do a technique called scraffito, where you take a semi-wet pot, put some glaze on the outside, under glaze on the outside, and scratch a design, and it ends up yes. looking like woodcut on the outside of a pot. Which It's very cool, by the way. It's very cool. I have one of your bowls. <laughs> so in order to get better at that, I practice drawing because I was so frustrated with, you know, I'm not really a patient person. And so I didn't really want to practice over and over for drawing. So I would just pick up a pot and start, you know, carving a design on it and obviously quite disappointed in the outcome. And so, yeah, I decided, hey, 
here's the thought. Maybe I should practice first. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had practiced drawing designs that I was drawn to, mostly birds and trees and botanicals. Right. And so when I came home from the hospital, after a period of recovery at home, I was still out of necessity supposed to stay away from people for months actually. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll draw. And quite some time ago, I took a watercolor class from fellow Anselm member Paulette Triplett. And I thought watercolor was great. It's always been my favorite painting medium, but I don't paint. I didn't paint. And so it's like, oh, that was really nice, but it's, you know, too complicated. I'd rather (laughs) go back to pots. So I did. And I thought, well, I'll just break this out and give it a go. And it became quite, I, blessing seems like such a small word. It really became a sweet outlet for all of the lessons that I was learning through the journey of illness and recovery. Right. And then as by extension, as I recovered, God really drew me to others who have experienced suffering and to be able to encourage someone with some scripture that really spoke to my heart, lots of different verses that spoke to my heart during recovery Mm -hmm. and putting a beautiful border around it or something was, it's just been really a meaningful ministry. Right, so essentially what I've seen you, the paintings that I've seen you do, and I actually, you allowed me to take one to a friend of mine who was struggling with a difficult diagnosis with her baby, which by the way, he's doing really well. Oh, great. I should have updated you on that. So essentially your paintings tend to be, to me it looks like you're looking through a telescope. I don't know if you did that on purpose, but they're round, right? I'm describing this for the listener. Um, And it's in nature. Paint paint a picture with your words, maybe. Yes, yeah, and I I should be able to, being a writer. Um, And then you write in pen the scripture around the painting. I, yeah, I have done that. I've been particularly drawn to, um, this is something I didn't do before, um, but I've been doing the night sky. Yes. And, you know, honestly, I have discovered more than ever that the only thing that can reach down to that deepest part of our pain during suffering is God's word. Yeah. You know, I can come and give you a hug and a good pat on the back and tell you I'm thinking of you or I'm praying for you, which is great, mm-hmm. you know, but I know in the darkest part of the night when I was struggling through illness, it was what broke through. You right. know, the Holy Spirit uses God's word, a living entity that actually touches our physical being. And so as much as we don't like it, we are told in this world we will have troubles Mm -hmm. and that you know i was just reading the other day consider it all joy my brothers whenever you have trials of various kinds knowing that the testimony of your faith produces perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so that we are mature and complete and not lacking in anything Mm -hmm. and all the time i think to myself is there a shortcut for this (laughs) can i just like skip to go do you know like go right Right. to payday and you know as we age as we get ill as we see others around us suffer as we suffer Mm -hmm. it's a part of what happens to us and so the word of god with beauty around it in a painting Mm -hmm. has been really precious is that (laughs) why you chose to do the night sky or was that sort of an organic Like, did you do the night sky because the night sky sort of symbolizes like the suffering with the starlight breaking through? Honestly, I I don't have to get out my... um... I like how you're inferring theme there, Mandy. That's good. That's another good writer's touch. (laughs) A writer slash former English teacher. This is my job, Matthew. (laughs) Talk about imagery and theme and how they contribute. Yes, how they... Because I hadn't really thought of that until you were speaking of that, even though I'd seen several of your Well, and this is actually an interesting topic on process, because I know that Matt and other Anselm members have disagreements on how to go about writing. Do you chart it out first? Oh, Oh, we're back to outlining. Oh, there we go. Man, we're talking to a painter and a potter, and we're talking about outlining. That's true, though. And honestly, it's it's what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Correct. You know, and everybody has a different thing. But what I... Nancy, Nancy, don't try to be all like... (laughs) 
you know, make peace, try to, no, this is a battle. One side right has to wrong. win, one side has to lose. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, it's a good thing I am a painter then because I won't lose because <laughs> I'm not in the battle. But no, I actually learned some painting techniques off of YouTube tutorials. And one of oh, them, YouTube. yeah, and one of them was a woman teaching how to paint a night sky. And as often happens, I find that the Holy Spirit will nudge me with a picture or a situation with a particular scripture. And as I had painted that night sky, I was drawn to Isaiah 40, where it says, look up into the heavens, who mm. created all the stars, he who brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by name because of his great power and his incomparable strength. Not a single one is mis missing. Oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Israel, how can you say the Lord ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the earth. He never grows weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. So the scripture came to you as you were painting. Is that what you're saying? Well, or I think I just... Um, does that happen at the same time? Okay, so in this... <laughs> In this process. That's a beautiful passage. Oh, yeah, passage. it is. And yeah. part of the process is you paint these colors that sort of blend together. I love the northern lights. If you've never seen them, you have to travel to see I them. haven't, and I did travel to the right place, but... Yeah, you can't always... Uh, they're not on demand kind no, of things. No, they are no. not. But so you paint your backdrop, whether it's... Not a streaming you know, service. <laughs> Can I put it in my corner? I'm here Give now. Give it a one-star review on Yelp. I came I all the way to Alaska. Alaska. <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> So you put all this background color, and then the process I use, there's this um, there's this thing, I don't even know what it's called, it's white paint that doesn't blend into other paints. Um, oh, handy. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you put a bit of it on your brush, and then you tap your brush over the top of your painting, oh, and splatter. it splatters, okay? So I remember splattering, thinking... That's an awful lot of stars I just splattered there. And then I realized, <laughs> wait, that's not even all of them. And then, oh, I love that thought. I thought about <laughs> this scripture and that the encouragement that God offers is everywhere. And especially as we look up at the night sky. And I love, I love, love the verse where it says he calls them each out by name. Mm -hmm. And I think that during illness and suffering, one of the greatest enemies that seeks to defeat us is feeling like you are alone, you're isolated, and no one sees you. Oh, absolutely. Because quite honestly, recovery is a very mundane process. Mm -hmm. And people have come out of the woodwork to be loving and generous and kind to me. But the reality is that you spend quite a bit of time by yourself. Mm -hmm. And after a while, it can be tempting to think, oh, does anyone see me? Mm -hmm. Really? And if God has given a name to every single one of those little stars, <laughs> he certainly sees me and he yeah. certainly knows my name. Yeah. So something that I've been thinking a lot about because, you know, a lot of people have gone through COVID, but your COVID experience has been so much more than most of us have. Most yeah. of us can even imagine because you had to spend so much time alone before you got COVID because of your health conditions. Then your recovery was so long because of that as well. And I just think a lot of people in your position, it would be so easy to go to, you know, fall into this sort of depression pit and not really do much. But the fact that you have not only not fallen into the pit, but used it to develop a whole new artistic skill, I think is really, really, really impressive. Okay, let's go back to a guild meeting we had a few months ago. We've been doing these uh, guild field guides where different artists will sort of give a talk on how they do their art. And you gave your talk on your pottery. And here's a couple things that really stuck out to me. You uh, had your little potter wheel, you're doing all that stuff, and you'd make a cool pot, and then something would go wrong through no fault of your own. It just happens. If that would have happened to me, I would have been like, well, I'm the worst. This is not going good. I, this is just not for me. I had my one good pot, and it's broken now. But you had this attitude like, oh, well, that one didn't work. Let me try it again. You seem to have this attitude with potters like, Things can go wrong with an awesome pot that you make, 
just randomly, and you just have to deal with it and make another one. Can you talk about that skill set and how you learned to do that? Yes, please. Well, in all of the studios I've ever taken classes at, there's usually a sign somewhere that says, don't get attached. Oh, I could not do that. <laughs> and so I have actually dropped pots coming out of the kiln even. Oh, like it goodness. made it all the way and... So that's integral to learning how to do pottery. It is. In the, from the you very see, beginning. If I ever dropped a pot like that, that would have been the end of my pottery career right there. <laughs> I would be like, well, I guess I'm going to be a mosaic artist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make pavement tiles. I'm going to yes. make stepping stones. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So not to go all deep instantly, but no, do I it. will say. Do it. We're here for I it. I will say that the one thing that I have learned my first foray into art was music and being a singer and then as I developed respiratory problems that pretty much left and I took up pottery and then when I got COVID couldn't go to the studio so then took up painting and one of the things that I've seen all along the way is that beauty and being an artist has a light and a dark side to it. Mm -hmm. And one of the dark sides is that we can be very, very tempted to take our meaning and our identity from what we're creating. And, you know, is it beautiful? Do people talk about it when they're not with me? Does it, did it get in the awards? Did I sell it? And how much did I sell it for? And did I sell it for as much as the guy at the booth further Next down me, from right. me? And I think maybe by the time I've gone on to glory, I will have gotten this lesson down <laughs> but yeah I think that what is particularly beautiful about pottery is that even when something doesn't work out it's still useful and a lot of times I'll put plants in things or I will you know whatever but yeah I think you have to hold loosely what you're working on whether it's a pot that you you know, flinched and stuck your finger through it and oh well, you know, squish it up and start over. There is quite, you know, and this is the thing. I don't mean to say anyone can write, but when we talked about doing the field guides, uh -huh. one of the gals said, I don't mean to see that anyone can write, but literally if you're literate, anyone can write. <laughs> and I'm not going to be condescending to say, oh, I could write like that because it right. is a, something that you have to work and work and work at. Right. But most people can pick up a pen and write something. Mm -hmm. Most right. people can't sit down at a potter's wheel and throw a pot into a vessel. No, I have proven <clears throat> that because you let me play around <laughs> before COVID. She let me play around on her potter wheel and it was pretty hilarious. And she was very patient with me, but wow. Right. And the bottom line is that as artists, we all need to encourage one another to say it's a process. Right. Right. And maybe you've reached the pinnacle of what you want in one medium. Do you have you read the Dr. Seuss book, Yurtle the Turtle? Yes. I yeah. love Yurtle the yeah. Turtle. OK, so <laughs> the king of Salamisand is always looking at something higher. That's true. Oh, this is higher than me. Oh, this is higher than me. And I think at the end he saw the moon higher than himself and he wanted to get more turtles so that he could be higher than the moon right. and that's our downfall is is comparing instead of asking ourselves is there a calling that is an interesting comparison though the pottery versus writing because like with pottery on the one hand you it's pretty obvious when you fail <laughs> <laughs> where with writing unless it's your mom your mom will take anything you make uh, <laughs> Everyone always says that, and I have to say, my mother is not the mother that loves everything I make, but that is all right. That's okay. But uh -huh. um, with writing, there's a tension because you're never sure. Did well, it, is this good? And something related to that, something yeah. you said, Nancy, that really stuck out to me was getting too attached to what you're doing. Correct. Where you can, I can absolutely see how if you're a potter, getting attached to a particular pot is just a non-starter because... The glaze could crack or whatever. That's probably not the right word. Through no fault of your own. It just happens sometimes. Whereas with authors, I have seen this in myself getting too attached to a particular line, a particular scene, maybe even a particular idea right. where you're part of you. Maybe like your more rational side, like this isn't going to work or like this line, it's, it's clever and all, but maybe it's not serving it where you get like, no, this is my clever line. I'm not letting go. <laughs> right. and, and then the art suffers because of that. And that's where the line murder your darlings yeah. comes from. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's your darling. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it would be nice in some ways, but the words, if they weren't working, if they would just sort of scramble themselves up on the paper <laughs> for me and just prove that they were bad. So that's interesting to me. I want to go back. So you had an art form before pottery that you had to let go of. And it sounds like this is just your journey that God is 
takes you through. Here, but, I, <laughs> but how awesome is that? Because if you had not had to let go of singing, would you have ever explored pottery? Well, okay, so this is kind of a interesting story. I was really involved in singing a lot when my kids were little, well, all the way through college. And then after college, I started singing with a couple guys, and we had this sort of Peter, Paul, and Mary sort of folk, Ooh, folk jazz Any sort recordings? Of um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Oh. We'll so, discuss this later. <laughs> so I basically kept doing this through the birth of our first child and the birth of our second child. And, you know, we didn't do like big venues, but we did a lot of church ministry. And when we wanted to have a third child, I thought to myself, I'm taking a kid with a babysitter to, you know, (laughs) watch my child or my husband stuck with them. That sounds bad, doesn't it? Stuck with them. No, they're alone with my husband. (laughs) Anyway, um, felt very, very clearly that God said, if you give this back to me and focus on your family, I will give it back to you eventually and there will be more. Oh, wow. And, you know, in my way of thinking, I was like, wow, am I going to be like Whitney Houston then? Am I going to, you know, because if you don't use your vocal instrument, it does fade. Yes. Well, It actually never really came back, but I was able to start pottery. I've never painted anything. I've never really drawn anything. My mom was an oil painter, and I was like, oh, I'm not as good as her. But I just jumped into the pool. (laughs) And so, you know, at age 50, I start, or 45, I start doing pottery. And then at age, well, hold on now, 58, (laughs) last year, started painting. Yeah. And I look at that as, you know, hopefully an encouragement to other people. You're never too old to learn something new and something beautiful. Well, that's interesting to me because at 52, I, you know, I wanted to be a writer as a child, but then I put it aside because of self, like, you know, whatever. <laughs> well, more because of self-consciousness yeah. and fear of failure and other things, like lovely things like that. And Sometimes I think, oh, this is just so ridiculous. Like if I ever get published, it's going to be like some story because some 60-year-old woman got published or, you know, and um, and so I get irritated with myself that I didn't start sooner. But then I think about the things that I'm writing. I wouldn't have written what I write now if I'd written it at 20. Yeah. And that's not to say 20-year-old authors can't be awesome, darn their, you know, faces, whatever. But <laughs> But I personally would not be the type of writer I am today had I actually written then. Any thoughts from you, Matthew? Well, my first thought is uh, the expression, darn their faces. I know. I just coined that today. You're welcome. (laughs) All right. (laughs) But yeah, and I, I think there's a lot to be said for just being open to pathways that you didn't expect at first. And like that, that's happened with me. Like I've, complained to, to a lot of the guild members about how my, my first sort of writing ventures didn't go the way I wanted. Right, the memoir. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, there's a whole slew of reasons why that didn't work out. And I'm now legitimately glad that it didn't work out, mm-hmm. which is stuff I could not have foreseen at all at the time. But that always, you know, it was something else, Nancy, that is related to that, that I'm really, I'll just keep saying nice things about you, that I'm really <laughs> impressed with you Please. about is <laughs> how how loosely you're able to hold your art, which like, like I said earlier with, you know, writing, it's very easy to get attached to particular lines. It's also attached to get into particular, very narrow views of success. And you've talked to us at the Guild. And I, I think it's been a very good corrective for us. Like you could do commissions with your pottery. Like there are plenty of people who would give you money to do a particular project. Like and there's plenty paintings. of us. Yeah, her there's plenty of us too. in the Guild who would do that. And now with your paintings too, but you choose not to because You'll articulate it better than me, but it's like, no, I, that whole thing commissions, it doesn't seem to just appeal to you and you're not going to go down that path. And I, I respect that. Well, thank you for just setting up the segue here for something ah. I, I wanted to make sure <laughs> and say, quite honestly, I think it has to do with your calling. I say that very deliberately because I don't want to have anyone associate shame or condemnation or judgment on them having pottery or painting or writing as a business and that's what they're called to that's great but about 25 years ago I was at a church service and the pastor preached on John 7 
And do you ever have those experiences where it seems like a huge spotlight is sort of like, yes. oh, <laughs> Cecil B. DeMille's voice? It was um, <laughs> coming from the heavens. Yes. I felt like God was telling me at that moment that this was going to be my life verse to use my spiritual gifts, which I believe are mercy and encouragement. Maybe a few others, but primarily oh, I, see I see a Absolutely. lot of mercy and encouragement. And the verse is John 7, 37 and 38. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture says, streams of living water will flow from within him. And at that moment, I thought to myself, if I ever get to become a potter, which I had already liked at that point, and I was, you know, 31 when -hmm. this happened, so maybe more than 25 years ago, I said to myself, if I ever get to be a pottery, I'm going to call it Living Waters Studio. And you do. (laughs) And I think... I do call it Living Water Studio, and I think to me, it's just reinforcing over and over that my calling is offering a little cup of living water in Jesus' name. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys remember a, a speaker, Ann Kemal Anderson. She would talk about giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. She would literally bring a cup of cool water Aww. to people, like if she saw someone in an airport that was, you know, sitting a long time or whatever, and she just, you know. And I thought that's what I want my art to be. I mm-hmm. want it to be that refreshment that only comes from the heart of Jesus that encourages that person. And so pottery has done that, and I've sold things before, but right. it's been a bigger blessing when I've been able to say, you know, I made this for you because I'd like you to have this. Right. And then with pictures, you can be even more specific. And there's been some amazing Holy Spirit moments where I will just say, I think I'm supposed to paint this for this person. Well, you don't and even then, know the young woman that I gave. Right. Yeah, and so I don't know if I told you this story. So my friend um, was late in her pregnancy and they found a chromosomal abnormality. And I had that morning seeing a painting of yours, Nancy, on Instagram with a verse. I'm not really clear on this sequence, but I remember it was close. I heard about the abnormality and I saw your painting, I don't know, within a few minutes of each other. Mm -hmm. So I texted you, messaged you, whatever, carrier pigeon, I don't know. (laughs) And I, I asked you if that was meant for anyone or if I could buy it from you. And of course you said, you can't buy it, but I'll give it to you. I believe those were your exact (laughs) words. And so I went and I picked it up from you and I had it framed or yeah, anyway. And then I took it to my friend and I cannot at the moment remember what verse it was now. Um, That one I believe was in Psalms. Yes, it was, but I can't remember exactly what Psalm it was, but I took it to my friend and she said, oh, and it's Psalm such and such. And I said, Yes. Why? Well, she assumed that she had told me that as soon as they found out they were pregnant with this child, before they knew there was any abnormality, God had been sending them to that song. Was it 41? I will look it up here. Okay. But anyway, that was just such a, as you said, Holy Spirit moment, because I didn't know that that psalm was significant to her for that baby. You don't even know her. No. (laughs) And, And here I am taking this one painting of your many over to her so psalm 139 139 if i say surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me become night even the darkness is not dark to you the night is as bright as the day for darkness is as light to you well he's a dear little boy and even though he does have the chromosomal (coughs) abnormality it hasn't shown up at all in his development and he's about six months old now so Anyway, but no, and I find that God works that way. That's why I I am such a firm believer in the Anselm Society and such a firm believer in art as ministry because Mm -hmm. music and writing and art many times bypass Mm -hmm. an emotion that you may be stuck in. I know Johnny Mm -hmm. Erickson Tata talks about singing and lifting a song of praise to the Lord, and she said that when she does that, she believes that her praise stands in opposition to her feelings, which is a pretty strong statement. But I think that we are in a battle and that our emotions are very strong and they can be good, but they can also sort of choke us. And related to that, so let's go back to this time when your your experience with COVID was so much more severe than the rest of ours was. And it and, continues. And it continues, yeah. <laughs> As I come in and, with my little oxygen. Yeah, she so little oxygen that, You know, that would put you in a difficult place to begin with. But then learning a new art form in that process just really blows my mind because I have tried at different points to get more into painting or getting more into like 
comic work because I've had times like I write what if I could learn to draw cartoons well enough to like do comics and I try it for a little bit and then I get like frustrated it's like oh I'm not instantly good at this ah forget <laughs> it and so I think my experience is probably the more typical one for people trying to learn another art form but you were able to go through that process where I'm guessing there's a lot a lot of patience required a lot of you know beginner mistakes along the way but you, you, yeah, yeah but you kept through it how, how are you able to do that Okay, well, you know, I had a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> what else were you going to do? A lot of time on my hands. And honestly, my sweet husband, he's just been such the most amazing caregiver, and he built a little corner <coughs> on the porch, a chair and a table and all kinds of flowers and plants. And so that was just a really safe space for me to go and not be around other people's germs. If people came to visit, they could sit across the porch. But, yeah, I think... It had to do with a lot of time on my hands, but it also has to do, again, with what I'm saying is a calling. I remember the first night I was in the hospital, laying there with, you know, tubes and whatever coming in and out, and I asked the Lord, am I going to die? Is this, you know, like when I went in, my oxygen was like at 62%, and I had 95% of both of my lungs filled with pneumonia. So I was like, okay, Lord, I'm ready. Is this it? Am I going to die? And I felt like he said, no, it's just going to be a very, very deep valley, but I will never leave you. And this is going to help prepare you to be a better minister of the gospel. And I am just so pleased that that turned into art. <laughs> And That's how he made you. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, like I said, I took that class with Paulette a number of years ago, and I was like, meh. You know, <laughs> I'm not instantly good at this. Meh. Okay. <laughs> so she did there have that go. thought, but then it came back around. Yeah. Like, it was okay. like time to come back around. And I think that I had had other things that had sort of contributed to it. But I just think God is an amazing economist, and nothing is ever wasted. And there's things that he will pour into your life over time. And then he gathers up those pieces and brings it to life in this particular activity or gift. Mm -hmm. And I've had things that I'm like, wow, you know what? I thought about that 20 years ago. <laughs> cool. Oh, so, wow. yeah. yeah, I think that's how God works. Now, what would you say, because I know this is true of me personally and other people I know in the Guild, for us, <laughs> the... COVID the past couple of years have stunted our ability to express ourselves creatively. I'm just wondering what you would say to us. <laughs> well, I think... Um, Give us a cup of cool water. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? Here's uh, um, some of the things that have come out of what I'm putting down in scripture with, you know, painting around it. And it is the theme of suffering and isolation mm -hmm. and fear and plans changing when you didn't want them to or worrying about things. So when I got sick, I wrote, there's a huge tree that's fallen into my stream of creativity. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. That and, is very accurate. And the water is diverted now. Yes. It's not going like before I got sick, I had had three months of just making pottery like crazy, getting ready for shows. Some right, shows. because you had yeah. all these art shows scheduled Yeah, I for had that like four summer. or five art shows and I was just making pottery like crazy and I'd come up with a really cool pottery booth, you know, for the shows. Right. And that whole thing just kind of went plop. Plop I, is the perfect onomatopoeia. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that all of us have that reaction when things change, when we have to become isolated, when we can't go do a show, when we can't do, you know, whatever. And I, like, I'll go back to Johnny Erickson Tata, you know, the woman learned to paint with a paintbrush in her mouth on okay. her teeth, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that we are all tempted to go, well, great, <laughs> great. That's, you know, or to be led by our emotions. I don't feel like it. Right. Instead of to say, are we going to walk by faith or, or walk by sight? And mm -hmm. I don't say that lightly or glibly no. because the suffering that people are walking through is acute and real. Mm -hmm. And so I think that my creativity 
was born out of a desire to make sense out of this. Right. It gave meaning to what I was walking through mm -hmm. because I was able to learn something new, which was pretty cool. I was <laughs> like, how, wow, how did I do that? It's, you know, <laughs> and it's like, it's the culmination of things. And I, you know, did some lessons. I actually started studying with a, a watercolor painter. She's really great. Lorraine Watry, shout out. Okay. But I think more than anything, it's given purpose and meaning to the change in my circumstances. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not gonna go out and do a show, I'm not gonna go out and do whatever. I'm still limited by wearing oxygen when I, I have any kind of activity going on. But I think all of us are just longing for being a part of something greater than ourselves, something mm -hmm. meaningful. Right. I mean, things shift, things change, and thing, disappointments are there. Yeah, and for me, I think even in the months that I spent staring at a blank screen or a blank page and unable to just get anything out of my heart or my brain. Yeah. I'm trying to trust that that was basically a fallow field season. And that, as you have said, you know, um, your words just a few minutes ago about how you'll remember things from years back. Yeah. Maybe it was not as dry of a season as it feels like right now. Maybe it's just because it's recent that it yeah. feels dry. But um, I have begun writing again, finally. <laughs> and maybe it wasn't just hitting the pause button. Maybe there is more going on in my heart than I have yet to recognize. Yeah. So. Well, and yeah. I think too that we are all well aware that this whole sequestering of COVID and you know illness and whatever, there is a temptation to withdraw even more than we have to because you just think, well, and quite honestly, it becomes a habit. Yes. You know, you have to, there's that period of shock where you're reorienting yourself to this new reality and then you kind of get into a rhythm of it and you have the opportunity to go out and you go, nah, nah I think I'll just stay home because right. it's what we're used to. And then, you know, again, we need to shift that. But mm -hmm. I think that there are lots of, ways we can stay involved with people. We just have to choose it. Like I have started doing mentoring with women and I do it over a Zoom call. Right. It's not what maybe I'd choose. I'd rather sit across your kitchen table. Correct, like we are right now. Yeah, I do think it's been a blessing that, I mean, I really don't really like technology, but it has, God can use anything <laughs> to further his kingdom. And so, yeah, the ability to still see people's faces even though it's not not the same but it's something yeah so yeah and, and usually unless you're part of a dance troupe or <laughs> a musical group art is a very isolating activity that's true and yeah. you know i find that i enjoy working in a studio with a bunch of potters in a class more than I love sitting by myself in my studio. Okay. So there's times, and that's like the guild. I mean, I'm guilty as everybody to not attend the guild mm -hmm. meetings, but you know, maybe there aren't other people who are doing exactly what you're doing, but the journey is very similar. It's like we're cousins in art. Oh yes, I've been in writing groups and I much prefer the art guild. It's, it feeds my writing creativity in a much fuller way. Yeah than just being around other writers, yeah. um, being around other creators, which makes sense anyway, because the novel that I'm working on right now was inspired by a song that I like, a folk song, and my character came from that. And so Ray Bradbury wrote stories just off of lines out of poems. Huh. And um, you know, I'm sure painters have painted from things they've read. So yeah. the cross-discipline is much more valuable, yeah. which is, you know, the same is true. There are parallels in the Christian life in the same way we need people who are different than we are and have different gifts than we do spiritually. Yeah. The same is true for creatives. Yeah. So yeah. one of my former pastors gave the illustration of the necessity of coming to church and being part of a body of believers as looking at ourselves as all sticks in a campfire. Oh, and I love that. when we're all in the campfire, we're burning brightly. But if you pick up a stick and take it away from the campfire and set it out, it dies, the embers die and the mm -hmm. flame goes down. And so, yeah, I look at the guild like that, like we are, you know, inspiring one another and the camaraderie mm -hmm. of fellowship is really important. Yes. 
Oh, man. And I haven't been in person to a guild meeting in months. I know. I keep Zooming. (laughs) And it's really not the same. (laughs) Very much not. Hopefully, if people listen to this, then there will suddenly be a bump in (laughs) attendance at the guild. So what do you see in your future? Like, do you think at some point you're going to be doing pottery and painting? Um, Well, there's what I call the... I shouldn't call them scary, more challenging. Uh, <laughs> hey, if scary is accurate, types for it. <laughs> of I, I'd really love to learn to paint some landscapes. I adore Paulette's portraits of people. As a matter of fact, oh, yes. as a Christmas gift to my husband, I had her paint a portrait of me from a picture that it's his favorite picture of me, and it's you know nothing stellar I'm just looking at the camera smiling but he loves it so I had her paint a picture of it and gave it to him for Christmas gift and you know I guess I'd like to get better um right in that area but one of the things that I've really enjoyed is um just keeping an eye out and listening for people who are walking a a particularly rocky road at that moment a tough Mm -hmm. journey and painting a cart because it's you can't always send a coffee mug in the mail to people. You can. You just have to go to the post office for it. Right. See, Whereas, and that's really interesting. God has made your new art venture more portable. Yes, and mailable. 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 I so that, is that, that a word? Mailable? We'll make it. I, it is now. <laughs> but no, that's, I think what I've been doing is just painting florals or botanicals on cards. I developed this one little one of a folk art tree with a little rabbit at the bottom of it, and I love rabbits. So it's like, oh, I can paint rabbits in my pictures. Oh, now. that's fantastic. So just art, adding little cute little artistic touches to things. But I think that as a society, we've sort of lost the art of snail mail. Oh, absolutely. I But I had some pen pals, actually Sarah Pottinger from oh. the Guild. We were pen pals during the shutdown, which I don't oh. know why we fell off. All right, I'm going to write her a letter. If she's listening, she should have it by the time this airs. I will write her a letter today. <laughs> and you know, Sarah has also been really an encouragement to me when I was in my recovery period. She's gone through so much isolation with migraines. With her migraines, and yeah. Sometimes I picture her like, what would I send to Sarah today? <laughs> right, yeah. I just so, love how God has brought us into community the way he has so yeah. Yeah. do you feel like you'll go back to pottery as well when that's possible I do okay I do I find myself looking at pottery videos you know people videotape themselves throwing a pot or trimming or right. something and it just creates this visceral reaction like I want to get my fingers in clay so is what is it is your oxygen level exertion stuff is that what's limiting you now or are you still pretty isolated um, so when I I'm just more careful, right. as you can probably hear. I have a little bit of a stuffy nose right yes. now, and it makes it particularly hard to breathe in oxygen. <laughs> yeah, funny how that there is. a stuffy nose, and I just, yeah. you know, caught a cold somewhere, and so especially during cold and flu season, I'm just careful to sort of stand further back from people and not be in really large groups that are sort of like uncontrollable. Right. Just as sort of a, I mean, it's not going to harm me greatly to have a cold. It just makes it really hard to breathe. Right. Oxygen. And you <laughs> don't have your, do you still have your home studio or did you have to, was that part of one of the homes you had to? So I have a painting studio in my house. My pottery studio is in a garage of one of our rental properties. Right. And so I think it's more like a great deal of exertion right. makes it harder to breathe. And one of the things I realize is that <laughs> when I'm working on a pot and a wheel, I hold my breath a lot. Oh, <laughs> like, huh, this is interesting. Maybe phenomenon. that's why I failed when you tried to teach me. You're I was your breath breathing. And you, oh, no, I was breathing. breathing. <laughs> that was my problem. No. no, it's just like, you know, intensely focusing. So yes. yeah, no, I intend to, but I, again, like, I said before, I'm just holding it loosely. Yeah, and because, God is giving you so much to do in the meantime. Yeah, yeah, I find that if I have a particular benchmark where I say on X amount of time, I'm going to be doing Y activity right. and Z will be the result, mm, that's kind of setting myself up. I mean, my doctor, when I got COVID in April, my doctor said I'd, she fully expected me to be off oxygen by October. And I was thinking, October? Like it was a long time? Yeah. And now here it's... And here it's you know, what is it? March? March of the next year. Yeah. And I am, you know, I have no idea. Maybe I'll be one of those people that wears oxygen my whole life. Maybe I won't, but I'm trying <laughs> to stop 
having an agenda of when that's supposed to happen. Right. But just say, you know, I'm just going to be faithful where I am at the moment. Okay, that's, see, up until a few years ago, I was never one of those people who had a word for the year, but then God started giving me one, and my word for this year is faithful. So I love that you just said that. Yeah. So that is... And because I have the same issue where I expect certain things out of myself, I'm a to-do list person. And instead of, a thing as simple as instead of saying how many words I'm going to write in a day, I just say how long I'm going to sit in front of my laptop. (laughs) (laughs) And that actually has allowed me to actually write. I don't even know how many words I write. I just know how long I'm going to sit in front of the laptop. Well, and as, as artists, we can... We know intellectually that there's certain activities that'll make creativity more productive. You know, I know that if my art table is clear instead of cluttered with everything on the planet, I'm more likely to want to sit down and paint. Right. Right. Or or whatever, my studio. If I have clay dust and stuff all over the floor, I don't really want to walk in there. there so go. there are things we can do to facilitate productivity. Mm-hmm. But when you hang your hat on saying, I have to get X amount done in Y time, right. you know, so I'm all about goals. Yes, but, but but you have to tweak them to yeah. be encouraging to you instead of discouraging. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, Nancy, thank you so much for You're joining welcome. us today. Matt can't say goodbye because he snuck out. He was doing an Irish exit. He gave me permission to tell on him, so he snuck out. But hey, the Anselm Society, we love Irish things, so Irish exits are among them. <laughs> Well, things are winding down here at the Anselm Digital Pub. The fire is down to embers, the customers are trundling home, and you've polished off your final glass. Once again, Believe to See is a podcast of the Anselm Society. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time.